uh, Daniel McDonnell on the line, uh, football correspondent of the Irish Independent. Daniel, good afternoon. Afternoon, John. Yeah, a sad day, Daniel. Um, Jack wasn't well, but uh, he was a huge figure in Irish sport and in the Irish nation. Ah, yeah, John. It's 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 a it's a, it's a I suppose national grief today, and it's not overstating it. I don't think you know it's um, like it's it's. I think it's just it's it's obviously a powerful legacy that someone leaves when you know their name is synonymous not just with their you know them the personality you know that person but what they represent like what they re represent in the lives of like so many Irish people of like so many different generations and even the you know I'm I'm feel myself you know consider myself very fortunate that I do remember uh, the the glory years that I was just about old enough to you know it's sort of turning five six and you're away yeah, and thinking this was the norm but like I think you know when when people are reflecting on Romania and Italy and and you know Stuttgart and all the great games it's it's not just like yeah Jack was great it's all it almost brings everyone back to that time to where they were in their life to the people they shared it with you know some of whom may not be here now and like that's sort of a, a powerful legacy for Jack to leave that he he gave us all these memories and you know there's a whole different discussion and debate you can have about legacies and style of play and I, I appreciate that will always happen and and that's all part of the discussion but just in in the in the terms of like the national euphoria and celebration uh and and the, the sort of the, the lifelong memories that that those of us can remember will carry with us no matter where you were and what part of life you were in if you if you can remember that moment you'll you'll never forget it like all the tributes from the people we've spoken to already today jason mcateer kevin moore and mick mccarthy Kevin Sheedy, they're all just, uh, they all just love the man. And it's just very simple. From a human being, they just love the guy. They, they bought into what he was about and he had a way of getting the best out of them. It's as simple as that, really. Yeah, I mean, like, when you consider that the, you know, the history of Irish football prior to that, I've listened to, I listened to John Giles and various guests and, you know, there was a lot of near misses and, and, and sort of dramatic failures and, and you know, injustices, you know, and, and various reasons that, that Ireland didn't qualify for, for tournaments, that the breakthrough didn't happen before 88. And, I mean, the whole fact that Jack and, and himself was a slightly, you know, chaotic appointment. Other candidates were favoured and he ended up coming in almost through the back door at the last minute. Um, but, but whatever your view of the legacy, like, he, he got the team across the line he had a he had a plan like it may, maybe it wasn't the most aesthetically pleasing plan but at least he believed in something you know and he had a way that he wanted the team to play and and uh, a purpose and an approach and he made decisions and like management is about making decisions sometimes we, we see managers that uh, that fail because they're actually afraid to maybe leave out big characters or you know you see for years you like you had England trying to shoehorn Lampard and, and Gerrard and, and Scholes or whatever and, and, and try and make it work and, and, and whatever it might be. But like Jack came along and decided he was doing things his way. This was it. If you're Liam Brady, you don't fit into it. Sorry. Or whoever it might be. David O'Leary until 90. Yeah, David O'Leary. <laughs> and he went with it. And of course, like if 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 Gary McCoy doesn't score the goal in Bulgaria, we, we could be we could be talking about a completely different story. But the fact is they got the points on the board. Um, you know, they got there and, and like I suppose the rest is history. And I, I don't have the like the the personal anecdotes that 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 people have. And I, I would often listen to like other, you know, journalists who were there in that era and some of the amazing stories that they have of of the access and the closeness and 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 just how good it was. But I, I did like back in two thousand and eleven um he was over to the, the, the independent we actually had him over as a sort of a, to give him a, a merit award or a, a lifetime achievement award and i did have a couple of hours in the afternoon with jack and his wife pat and listen the mind wasn't as sharp as it was he admitted it himself but the one thing that sort of that really clicked him into gear was talking about going to mexico in 1986 and, and watching belgium uh who were in Ireland's qualifying group, they got to the semi-finals in '86, uh, and they, you know, they were the team to watch. And all of a sudden, like he was, you know, he wasn't, you know, he was struggling with his with his recollection of certain things. But once he started talking about the way Belgium played, he was off. You know, he was off in one, and uh, you know, he was taking mobile phones and and uh, coffee cups and whatever. And 
you know, talking about the, the space Belgium left behind their full backs and he was telling Chris Morris or whoever it was to do this and this was Houghton and this was Aldridge. And um he was he was suddenly he was in the moment. Like he was back and and Pat, who was sort of listening nearby, it was lovely, like, you know, she was just there reading the paper. But anytime he stalled or just got a bit stuck and it couldn't think of something, she would interject and try and fill the gap or whatever it was. But when, when he sort of got through that passage, I mentioned it in the piece earlier, she, she was just saying, yeah, you, you never stop him talking now. Like, and, and there was that moment of clarity that reminded you that, yes, like we have, we have an image of Jack in a, as, a, as a personality and a charismatic figure, but there was also a method to what he did, and it worked. Whether you liked it or not, and whether opponents liked it or not, it worked. Uh, we're also joined on the line um, as well by Vincent Hogan from the Irish Independent, who might have been on the beat with Jack uh, a little bit earlier than Daniel. Vincent, how are you? Good, John. When did you start uh, on the beat with Jack? When did you first meet him, Vincent, do you remember? Uh, my first time would be Italia 90. Um, and I suppose I, my memory of Jack, funnily enough, I'm, I'm quite shocked to think that Jack was only 51 when he got the Irish job in 86, because... He always radiated the sense of seniority. And, you know, for someone like me, be 30 in, in Italia 90, in his company, you felt like a 16 year old because he had that great sense of authority. And, and the thing about him, John, was he, he always understood the force of his presence. He was a big man physically, but he had a big personality too. And I think that was the key to his management that, you know, Daniel is touching on it there that. He had great clarity in how he wanted his team to play. But what was completely underplayed was his, the research he'd do on the, the opposition. Yes, Ireland may have had what seemed a relatively primitive system, but it was factoring in all of this information on the opposition. And you talk to any of the players who played under him, they knew exactly what their opponents wanted to do with the ball. So he was very clever like that. But the other thing that strikes me, and I don't think he gets enough credit for this, he never played the card of being a World Cup winner. He never brought that up into conversation. It was never there unsolicited. Yes, we tried to bring it up occasionally. Like that day in Genoa, inevitably he was asked, how does this compare to 66? And actually that day he said, this is probably better than 66. But he never waved that flag of being a World Cup winner. And I think... That's why Irish people really took to him so so quickly, that there's, there's so many different strands to Englishness, if you like. But I think particularly the northwest of England with the Scousers, the northeast with the Geordies, they have a very similar sense of humour to Irish people. And Jack had a great sense of humour. And, and I remember interviewing him in his hotel room in Orlando in 94, and he was pouring... Uh, two pints of Guinness out of his private keg and he was looking to to get a particular match up on the television and he threw me the, the remote control because he was looking for his glasses he couldn't find them and um, I started going through the channels and I ended up hitting the adult movie and if you saw his face <laughs> light up immediately he says that's all right we'll stay with it stay with it the football football will do later and he had that great crack in him even though during, a ta during US 94, he was really stressed out about the heat and you know, the style of play that Ireland played with the heat. But he had that humanity as well. And another thing that strikes me is he was very loyal, that uh, he had a particularly close relationship with the older, more senior soccer writers, Charlie Stewart of the Irish Press, Noel Dunn of the Irish Independent, Billy George of the Examiner, Peter Byrne of the, of the Irish Times. And... I always thought he had a particularly kind relationship with Charlie. And in the mid-90s, when the press was coming toward its end and there was a lock-in of the staff in Burkey, Jack went along, just, I would imagine, out of support for Charlie, to have his photograph taken in solidarity with the, 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 the journalist locked in. And he just had that sense of decency about him, which I, I think is why people loved him. And the access then was completely different, Vincent, and... Uh, did, I'm sure you had a few rows though as well with them. Oh, he was he was a desperately intimidating man, um, and and that's what I mean by you could feel like a 16 year old in in his company. You really were very careful not to step out of line with him, and he he had a great understanding of his presence in a room, and I I think that's what made him such a good manager that he could communicate that sense of authority uh, to anyone, you know that, um, and he, he you know. 
if you go back to the Dave O'Leary situation, and I know Dave O'Leary's family were very hurt that here was this gloriously talented centre back with Arsenal um, who couldn't get a game under Jack. But but Jack was very clear cut in what he wanted from his centre backs, and and he had played alongside Bobby Moore in that England team in '66. And Clive Tilsley tells a story today on Twitter where he was giving an after dinner speech, and he was talking about the, the last seconds of extra time in the final against West Germany in 66 and England are 3-2 up and the ball comes to Bobby Moore and Jack roars at him, Rose Ed, Rose Ed and of course Bobby Moore never kicked one into Rose Ed in his life he was a, this beautifully elegant centre half so Bobby actually dips the shoulder cups, cuts inside a couple of German players and hits this beautiful ball up towards Jeff Hurst and Next thing that happens, of course, is that famous commentary. They think it's all over. It is now, as, as Hurst gets his hat trick. But Jack would tell that story against himself because to him, in that situation, there was only one thing to do, and that was Rose Ed. I think he saw in O'Leary something similar to the Bobby Moore style of play, but he would bristle, absolutely bristle, at players getting caught in possession just on, on the edge of their own penalty area. You, you know, you see it all the time in the Premier League, Brighton against Liverpool earlier this week, two goals conceded in eight minutes because they're just trying to play out against better, technically better players. He would have been frothing at the mouth looking at that. And that's why he preferred Kevin Moore and Mick McCarthy with Paul McGrath in front of them. His idea was you play football in the opposition, the opposition half, not your own. Do you kind of subscribe to the theory, Vincent, that, and I would, that it... it what Jack and the team did changed Ireland forever? Um, I think it changed our sense of ourselves. It changed our expectations. Um, we were so beaten down psychologically to expecting disappointment, certainly with our soccer team. And, you know, I, I, I would think it's very important to say that he inherited a really top-class group of players from Owen Hand. And Owen Hand was a very unlucky Irish manager. And he didn't have the look that Jack had when Gary Mackay scored that goal in Sofia. But what Jack did then was he had that certainty of purpose about how he wanted the team to play. And I think Euro 88 changed everything, not so much the, the national psyche, but the psyche of the players. And from that came our own sense of self, like Italia 90, US 94, we just expected that team to get results against the best teams in the world. It's often forgotten that we went to US 94 on the back of friendly wins away to Holland in Tilburg, away to Germany, I think in Han Hanover. And then our first game in, Italia nine, or in US 94, we beat the Italians. I mean, that was the caliber of team we had at that stage. I think we were ranked ninth in the world going to that World Cup. So it was, that was something that was unimaginable to to people growing up in, in the 70s and 80s. And, and one outstanding memory for me is the day in Genoa when Dave O'Leary got the penalty to put us into the quarterfinals. I turned to go up to Noel Dunn, our soccer correspondent, who would have been roughly the same age as my dad. And like my dad at the time, was going through health problems and was really struggling with the, the heat at the time. And I was in the habit of just going to check on Noel to see that he was okay to do his work. And as I went up to him, he was about four rows back, he was in floods of tears. And that really brought it home to me. This guy, he was probably 20 years on the soccer beat. He never imagined he'd see a day like that. And it was Charlton's sense of certainty that brought us those days. And Dan, I'd say you'd love those days as the man in that job now. Yeah, no, th those stories are getting me going now. Like, that's, that, is, um, that is the power of it. Like, you, you know, people obviously remember the... Um, I like I've watched it already today, like the reading in the years clip of like the the the, the grown men in tears. Like as I sort of mentioned it earlier on, like a generation of men who probably weren't used to crying or weren't it was almost frowned upon maybe to cry in public so openly. I don't know, whatever the attitude might have been uh towards it. And you know, listen, Vincent puts it so well there and he lived it, he was there, he was through it. And uh I can only imagine. I, I saw someone make the point earlier on that, like that, actually, it's the maybe the generation who saw football in the country before it, you know, appreciate it even more. Whereas I mentioned, like people around my age who who grew up and all of a sudden we had like three tournaments in six years and this was the norm, 
Um, I, yeah, of course. I, like, we'll never have anything like that again. Like, I don't think we ever will because nothing, nothing beats the first time. Um, and it's very hard to, to recreate. Like, the, the innocence sounds patronising, but you know what I mean. It's, it's more the sense of, like, this was just... This was raw and this was natural and, like, it was unbridled joy. Like, the scenes were, like, scenes people hadn't experienced. And, again, listen, I'm not the best place to talk about it, but obviously, you know, Ireland in the 80s had its problems. And, you know, you talk to people, I think it's Declan Lynch has the book about Italia 90 and... Yeah, we're going to have him on the show, yeah. Y- a bit yeah, like, you know, I, I don't know, like, how, how far you go with it in terms of what role it played and what, what happened afterwards for the country. But certainly, it made everyone stand tall and proud, I guess. And, uh, yeah, you, you know, you, you'd, you'd love to think that we will have days like that again. Um, and, I, you know, I really hope that we do. Um, but it'll always be different, you know, where we're, we're, it's a bit more cynical and, and we're a bit more aware of our surroundings now that I'm not sure if we'll ever lose ourselves like we did in that moment and you know for for that you know generation that older generation from a more maybe more conservative Ireland and from a very you know who 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 lived through some pretty challenging times and away from just football but in, in life or whatever to to have that moment must have been the outpouring of emotion like we're watching it as kids wondering why, you know, getting into it, but wondering why everyone is so emotional almost. Um, and you get it now. And you're so grateful now that you actually, you were able to, to see it. But I can only imagine what it was like to really, to really feel it, having uh, having maybe lived through some of the darker days beforehand. And 25 years uh, of age and younger won't remember it, Vincent. You then travelled to USA 94. I mean, the giant stadium. These things must be just in your DNA, just even as a as a reporter for the rest of your life. Oh, big time, John. And, and the thing that struck me was he, he had this really sincere, genuine connection with the supporters. And he took really serious pride in the conduct of the Irish supporters, that they could go in their thousands and spend the days drinking and, and never cause trouble. And what's often forgotten is the day of the famous win in the giant stadium, and we're all jumping around celebrating. Jack is actually running on the pitch to remonstrate with um, two uh, the U.S. police, New Jersey policemen who have pinned two Irish supporters to the ground because they've run onto the pitch celebrating. And, you know, New Jersey police were not familiar with that kind of scenario of people running on a pitch celebrating. So they're, they're pinned to the ground face first, and one of them is bleeding from the face. And Jack was absolutely outraged by this. And, and, you know, in that moment of arguably his greatest triumph, that was what he was doing. He was, he was remonstrating with them to, to go easy on the supporters, that they were just celebrating. But he, was, he just had that bond. You know, it's, it's, I was just watching so, a, a clip on um, Twitter earlier, and, you know, it, it goes back to the BBC Personality of the Year programme where his, his brother Bobby is getting an all-time achievement award, and, and they get Jack to present it. And there's a great sense of melancholy to that because of course they didn't talk for years and there's this kind of moment of reunion between himself and Bobby and and he he just he looks at the trophy and he says Bobby is the greatest player I've ever seen and he's my brother and you can see the emotion welling up in, in Bobby Charlton at that moment so there was a sadness in him as well that so many years went by where he didn't talk to his brother that is a very touching and uh, tough day for Bobby today, um, Vincent. Were you at Anfield, Vincent, in '95? Yeah, I was. Yeah. I was. And you're a Liverpool fan, so like a, 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 for a lot of reasons, that must have been an, an incredible night. Yeah, it was an incredible night, but it was also you just knew the game the end, was up. Yeah, the end. Really, yeah. um, I, I think I'm right in saying, John, that that night we started with something like seven defenders in the team. It was a very lopsided team. That the, the, the great years had basically begun to dissipate and and jack's personality i i I think it began to dissipate with him and there was you know you you could sense the sadness of it that we i think we all knew that night at anfield the dutch were way too good for us and we we all knew when we waved to the crowd at the end of that game that it was probably the end and and he, he went after that before he was pushed and that was the sadness that you you could tell he had probably lost it in, in, in the sense of the magic he brought for 10 years. It, it was gone at that stage, but it was gone largely because the team was gone. Yeah. Is he a bit like Brian Clough, Vincent? Like, is it going kind to of jack work now, do you think, uh, that kind of manager? I, I don't think so. I, I don't think so. I think the game is evolving so 
constantly. I mean, we even see Marino at the moment. He looks like a relic of the past um, because the likes of Guardiola and Klopp have just brought such refinement to their game plans and there's so much technical knowledge put into game plans and particularly an attacking game plan. And I, I think that's where Jack probably would be, would be cut short. He, his, his greatness as Ireland manager was, was built on making us very, very difficult to play against. Now, we did play some wonderful football at the time. I always mentioned the USSR game in, in, in 88. But one game really stands out for me is 91, April 91, Wembley Stadium against England. We drew one all, but we played England off the park that night. So he, he, you know, it would be wrong to kind of label him as a one-dimensional kind of manager who just kick and rush. It was, it was a lot more than that. But no, I, I think he was of his time, but he was brilliant of his time. I much loved as we... Uh... Uh, pay tribute to him today, Vincent. Absolutely. You can hear it in everybody's voice, anyone who dealt with him. You know, I would have a special interest in Paul McGrath, who's issued a, a yeah, really be yeah. beautiful statement. Um, today he wrote his book, he... Vincent, of course, as well. Yeah, and, and Paul refers to him as a father figure. And as everyone knows, Paul never met his real father. So, And Jack Charlton, when, when Paul was having his scrapes, was just a kind man. And a, and a good man, and you know, it, it was less, much less to do with football than with people when it came to, to Jack dealing with Paul, and, and, and Paul clearly will never forget that. Vincent, thanks for joining us on Off the Ball Saturday. Pleasure, John. Vincent Hogan there from the Irish Independent. Diana McDonnell is staying with us from the Irish Independent. Just read out some messages we're getting in from our listeners. Uh, I think of Jack Boom, 1990 penalty shootout, Packy saves, O'Leary scores, leg it out the door, my black and white Italian anti ball, booted against the wall, hit a nail, devastation. The highs and lows, Bill. The highs and lows. Hashtag RIP Big Jack. After living through the joys of the Jack era, I had the pleasure of meeting him in the Celtic Club in Luton in 2000. I bought him a pint of Guinness and he was such a pleasant and down-to-earth man. The chat with him was like having a pint with your dad. When Jack was in charge, they used to come over to Carrick Cross and County Monaghan to train. You would often see the Irish team in the Fiddler's Nightclub, now owned by our own Banty. Uh, but there would be no sign of Jack. He would be out in the many lakes around Monaghan doing a second love at the time fishing. Thanks for the memories, Jack. That is from Barry in Carrick Macross. Uh, good stories there from Vincent, Daniel, and um, it really, I suppose, it is a time, it is of an era, but it was, a, it was an era that spanned 10 years, and if you reach three tournaments, um, that's something we'd, like, we'd take anybody's arm off for now. Oh, we'd love it. Yeah, it's funny, someone mentioned Carrick Macross because I grew up in like an RG quite close, and I yeah. remember going to watch the team train I think they trained in Dundalk sometimes as well, but in particular Carrick Macross because they'd stay in the the Neuromore Hotel it was, and uh, I have some old photos meeting Chris Hewitt and a few others back in the day. But yeah, like, you know, it was it was it was unprecedented. You know, it was th three tournaments in you know in six years, and and like not just sort of going to the tournaments, but actually participating in them. Particularly like you know the eight like. The, the Euro 88 campaign is still our greatest qualifying achievement. You know, it was an eight-team finals. You had to win a group to get there, um, and and we did it. And like you know, that 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 is the, the context that you have to put some of the previous failures in. And Vincent's right to mention Owen Hand and people who who could have got there. It was way harder to qualify for stuff. You weren't you weren't finishing third in a group and going into a playoff. It was a different, you know, it was a different qualification beat. And as it happens with 90. Um, you know, they were almost comfortable in the end going to Malta. One thing, uh, you know, one thing I think about all this, Dan, is that, sorry to interrupt, yeah. we did this whole World Cup series during the pandemic. Obviously, we're trying to keep people um, going during that, that three months, and hopefully, you know, we're, we're emerging from that now. Ireland were robbed so many times by re bad refereeing decisions. Belgium for the 82 World Cup, France before then, Bulgaria under Johnny Giles, and that kind of thing. And when we watched the 1990 video, the official film, I think the first thing they showed was an Irish fan, and they kind of followed them throughout the tournament. I actually think us qualifying for these tournaments and the way we conducted ourselves as fans, as supporters in Ita at Italia 90 and at the World Cup in USA 1994, the powers that be in world football, whether it's like overt or covert or whatever, wanted us there. And I think that actually is one of the legacies of Jack. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, it's a shame they didn't want us there in 2009. But like you know, the the yeah. the, the uh, like it is it is true. Like it is true. I mean, like, I I know that sometimes 
elements of the fan stuff can still be overplayed. Like there is no doubt, and we've we see it with some of the viral videos and the you know in the Euros and let's serenade some nuns and whatnot. I get that. Like that's not for everyone. Like people are having a good time, but I appreciate why you can also great and maybe more so in recent years and like you know year 2012 when the football wasn't good at all and, and that was all we had um whereas like back then it was all wrapped in together it was the fans just enjoying being there but also a team that was contributing to the competition and actually doing stuff in the finals and like you mentioned you know the 1990 workout video and yeah of course, all this almost seems fresh because we've been in nostalgia mode all summer here on saturdays but the uh, yeah the, the the Irish contribution to that event and particularly in light of you know you know football in the eighties and you know Heisel and and Hillsborough and you know the the ban on on English fans or English clubs from Europe and you know even around Italian ninety itself there was still crowd trouble you know Euro eighty eight there was crowd trouble like you you look through the archives and a lot of the front pages around that time are still were still almost dominated or, or largely influenced by that because there was a almost a constant threat and a fear. And as a result, and as a, I mean, it's our, it's our, it's where we are condemned to this for history. We will always be associated with the English. We often get called British, whatever it might be. Um, but our, our fans were, were a, a different proposition, but yet of course managed by an Englishman, an English hero, which is always so, sort of a quirky subplot to the whole thing that we had this expression like this, this outpouring, this expression of, of national pride and and love for the country, um, and yet like you have an Englishman managing the team, and you would think there would be some kind of complications with that in some ways or whatever it might have been, but but there wasn't, you know, and and also as well, um, and like again, you know, you can talk about the legacy of the era and and, and style of play and all this stuff, not, none of which was Jack's fault. Like he was there to do his job to do the best thing he could. He exploited the grandparent rule, like, you know, better than anyone before. Um, but like, but that almost added to the connection in some ways, because a lot of those players, like they were the first and, and second generation. Uh, they're from the families of like the, the Irish people who really had to emigrate due to really like pressing dire, you know, economic need. And so that gave it probably the diaspora part of the story as well. And I always, of all the stories I like, I love just, I love, I, I'll never get tired, to be honest. I know people get sick of nostalgia, but I'll never get tired of listening to some of the stories of Euro 88 and Italia 90. I've read some stuff recently about what it was like, I think, to be Irish in London during that time, what that must have been. And, and the fact that Jack was a World Cup winner, um, it, it all just wraps into it. It all, it all wraps yeah. into the whole magic aspect of that story. 